Please, if you can't hear me, don't tell me. Just come a bit closer. <laughs> because I've had so much coffee. <clears throat> if you cut me open, there's not going to be blood coming out. Um, <laughs> I've been to the States uh, six weeks or seven now, fundraising, as you said, for the monastery. From there, I flew back to Bucharest to, to see my father confessor. And from there, back to Mal for a week to see builders and surveyors and planning officers and all sorts of lovely people. Um, uh, the help of whom we need to establish this monastery. So, I don't really know why I'm here. And now you've asked me three years, this is the third year, and I said no twice, I said the third time I should get it done with. And when I said <laughs> yes, when I said yes in October, it sounded like I have so much time to prepare something really smart. Uh, but then time has a way of just disappearing. And, and I prepared something extremely deep five minutes ago. So <laughs> these are just my notebooks. I've got a whole collection of them. And as I travel from one place to another, I, I just make notes for myself. So I'll just draw on these. It will not be a long talk, just because I don't have a lot to say. But I hope, I hope at least one or two of you will, will make sense of, of it. Um, I would like to begin by asking forgiveness to <coughs> both fathers present here, um, because I'm I consistently, uh, and, and because, I, <laughs> because this is not based on any sort of uh, real patristic research or any sort, uh, anything, it's just based on my silly experience. And that's why I know, it, it, it's, I, I, I know this is the best way to give a talk. It's the most risky way to give a talk because it might come to nothing. But if it does come to something, it will actually touch somebody. Base it on your own experience. And that's dangerous because you expose yourself. It's more or less like a public confession, um, which is not pleasant ever. Um, but it has something alive about it, rather than being smart about it. Um, and I'll just, I'll just start with, I mean, the whole, the, whole, the whole talk can be reduced to one sentence. I'll start with that, and then we'll see if we can expand it. <coughs> Um, I've got these notes and these notes. And really that sentence is that I cannot believe and I refuse with all my being to believe that our vocation can be that we become lawyers or accountants or writers or painters or whatever you want you know, whatever other profession you may think of. I refuse, I simply refuse to believe that Christ created me or any one of you in order to spend your life being an accountant. There's something wrong about that. There's something wrong about reducing vocation to, to a career or a profession or a job. There's something about the way uh, the, the society around us has, has trained us to see our lives as, as a career path. Almost as if you, you, know, you go through your life year after year, and then when you get to retirement, you look back and say, oh, I have a wonderful CV. Well, who cares <laughs> about your CV? <laughs> Who cares? This is actually very serious, because most of the people I know mistake their life with their careers. They feel that if, if they manage to be the best lawyer or the best teacher or whatever in their town or in their country or in the world, they've achieved something. Well, on my way here from Mull, I stopped overnight in Whithorn, because I've never, been, I've never seen uh, St. Ninian's cave. And I really, really wanted to go there and pray to St. Ninian because he is the reason we started the whole monastery on Mal. The, the ancient monastery there and the current church is called Kil Ninian. It's the church of Ninian. And I went, and it takes a long time. It's about two miles, if not more, to get to the beach. And then it's about another mile to get to the cave. And the cave is this tiny little thing, really tiny. And as you look up, I've got lots of photographs, I think I'll post them on, on, on the monastery website. As you look up in the cave, um, you see these two huge blocks of, literally just mountains. 
this distance one to another. And as I looked up, all I could think was, that's where I belong. In the sense that everything I am, everything I am, and everything you are, everything we stand for, everything we waste our life for, all our knowledge, all our stupidity, all our laziness, so everything we are or fail to be will end up between those two pieces of rocks. As so many generations before us, from Adam and Eve until the last Adam, as you know, Father Sophron used to say. And when you have that perspective, when you begin with that I think the whole question of vocation and identity and all of that um, takes a very interesting turn because Christ made me so that I may survive death and share in his eternal life. That's my vocation and in that vocation I shall find my identity. I shall discover who I am at the end of this line of life. Um, everything else is secondary. Everything else. If you end up being the best, uh, no, I don't, I don't have professions to, to refer to, I don't know, accountant in your city. I really like accountants, actually, by the way, because they are wonderful donors. So, but it's just an example. <laughs> if you end up being the best accountant in the world, or a dust, or a cleaner, or s something completely unimportant, it is irrelevant. <clears throat> because 200 years from now, both people will be in the same space between those rocks, and everything they've achieved. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Not only your careers, not only our nice clothes or our, you know, uh, skinny flesh or fat flesh, or, but also our friends, the friendships we've, we've, we've created, and, um, and our families, um, our children, if you have any. Uh, everything, everything is reduced to this question. Do I, do you survive death and share in Christ's life? Or do I fail to do that? Um, you know, when I, when I, it's silly to say, but I've never decided to become a monk, but when I, I knew that I, would, I have to be this thing people call the monastic, because, because nothing else seemed to be alive. I was 19 when this thing kind of doomed upon me. No matter what I did, no matter what I did, no matter how successful I would be. And I was, I was um, my first bachelor degree is in economics. I wanted money and I wanted lots of it. And, um, but it, how much money can you have? And by the end of one's life, w w what's the use of all that money? And how many children can I have? And truly, I mean, if you leave behind, yes, the love you have for your children and the dedication and everything else, the question of your own personal death and life is still there and your children are completely, utterly useless. They can't help you in any way. You, yourself, will have to face these questions one day. With children, without children, being married, not being married, healthy or not healthy, it doesn't matter. These questions will face you one day. And, and everything else made no sense. I'm giving you the, a bit of an insight into my, my mind when I was 19 and what eventually uh, you know, took me into a monastery. I thought, I'll have a career, I'll have a good job, I'll go, I'll go to my job every day, I'll make lots of money so I can go back home, so I can have a nice home, nice clothes, nice food, I go, so I can go back to work, make more money, go back home, go back to work, make more money, and then one month goes by, one year goes by, my life goes by, I'm on my deathbed, I look back, and what have I done? I'm still the 19-year-old with the same questions, unanswered and just as painful to look at. And I've invested the 30, 40, 50 years of my life in vain attempts to just create noise so that I don't hear the questions anymore. 
That's, that's perhaps the best way I perceive life. Just noise. We make noise. As much noise as possible. Um, so that the real questions never touch us somehow. There is a tension there. A tension of one who feels called to survive this nothingness and, and to face death and actually conquer it. And then the other self who is aware that you can do nothing uh, by your own means. And this tension is the <coughs> battleground of our lives. And there are, I believe, two options. You, you go in and you fight it, <coughs> or you find ways to go in with your eyes closed and hope to God that somehow you manage not to open your eyes and to find yourself in the middle of the you know, battleground. And I think that's the distinction between a really spiritual person and someone who's just kind of faking it. Because many of us just kind of fake it. Um, we just need some sort of comfort. We need to acknowledge these questions, but not really go forward and address them. They are there. I acknowledge them, but I don't want to look into what they actually imply concerning my life and those around me. Um, and this was actually not according to plan. <laughs> <laughs> I have here these notes. True vocation is actually not to belong, not to make it work, and not to grow any roots. And by that, I suppose, what I wanted to say is that, yes, the minute you become aware that your true identity, your destination, so to say, is not here, but somewhere else, not a space, but a being, that you, the end of your destination, your identity, is a being, Christ, not a state or a um, career, then you realize that our true vocation really is not to belong here, to do our best not to succeed in this world, but to actually make a mess of it. Because if you succeed in this world, and you end up growing roots in this world, and you feel comfortable in this world, and you made it work, and you've got it going for you, if you end up looking at yourself in the mirror, and actually making sense of yourself in this world, you failed because we are not meant to fit in this world. We do not belong to this world. And mind you, these, these may sound like things that have no practical, practical value to them, but these unpractical questions and thoughts ended up taking me into a monastery and saying no to a married life. That's extremely practical to me. So um, if you allow these questions to grow within you, if you allow yourself to be, I, I, I call it mad, just mad enough to let them grow and crush you and, and depress you and you fight them year after year, at the end of that fight, you might end up truly discovering what your true vocation is. And yes, there may be stages. I, I'm, I'm aware of that. There may be stages. You might begin your life being a lawyer or an accountant or a teacher for a few years. But there will be a time in your life when you, you will certainly feel a calling to switch to something else. In the sense that rather than having the question, should I be employed by this firm or the other company or, uh, or should I go to this university or the other, the question will be, should I become a monastic, or should I get married, or should I live alone? Or should I buy a little hut somewhere far away and just dedicate my life to, to prayer and make some money, I don't know, selling something online? Or You will just notice a type of, just there's a different nuance to the questions that happen in your mind. Um, but that will only happen if you go full steam ahead, no matter what you do. 
I love something that Father, Father Alexander <coughs> said yesterday about, um, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm bad at remembering exact quotes, but really just do everything you, you, you feel with all your heart. With all your heart, yeah. I remember one of the first times I felt the priest I was confessing to is my spiritual father was when very early on, on you know, I was 19, 20, he, he just took my, my, my head as I was kneeling down and he kissed me on the forehead. Mm-hmm. I felt confess something absolutely horrible. And he said, my name was Leo back then, Leo, do you know why I love you so? And I thought, he's mad. I, li- I already liked him. He's mad. He said, I love you because no matter what you do, if it's something good or if it's a sin, you do it with your whole being. There's no middle ground. And I thought, well, it makes no sense. I mean, I assumed if you are a sinful person, if you commit a sin, at least then you should feel kind of, well, I won't commit 100% of it. I'll do just 70% of it. <laughs> and my father confessor said, no, do 101. <laughs> because, and actually, actually it makes sense. Because, he said, if the prodigal son had been someone who was good at managing his wealth and had not wasted his wealth on whatever he wasted his wealth upon, but actually constructed the budget and spent only what he could afford every year, he would never have reached rock bottom and come back to the father. Death might have surprised him while he still had money, so to say, far away from the father. So whatever you do, good or bad, be honest about it. I am a sinful person. This, the thing I'm doing, is a sin. So I'm going to do it with Christ, Christ with me, as St. Peter Patrick says it. And you just go full steam ahead. Because if you do it, then your heart will just melt. And that melting of your heart will bring you back. If you just kind of have this lake of water that never changes, you kind of commit sins, you know, 30% of that and 70% of that and 50% of that, you're kind of always, you're not away, you're not with the Father, you waste your life just being comfortably numb. That's, that's, that's the word. You just, you're never fully repentant, you never feel you are, you are in hell and not a metaphor, in hell itself. And you never feel, oh, I've, I'm, I've got Christ in me. You'll always be lukewarm. And I don't think that's healthy in any way. So if you start your life by being a teacher, just do everything for that. And then that, let's call it secondary calling, secondary vo- vocation, will lead you to something else, the way father was, lead, was led to marriage life, married life. And then through that, further on, a mystery will happen between you and Christ, and you will become a truly spiritual person. But that truly is a mystery. I mean, that's not something to give talks about. Um, it will just be between you and Christ. Just have confidence that if Christ created you, he must have loved you enough to want you and if he wants you he will defeat you and that's good for us actually go just just leave your lives i know it sounds silly for a monk to tell you leave your lives but leave your lives and own up to it rather than being a tiny mice doing naughty things and feeling kind of guilty not just just do whatever you feel called to do good or bad and always ask christ to change you. If this is bad, change me. If this is me fighting you, defeat me. Own up to who you are. I feel much, much more comfortable encouraging the people I I hear in confession, the very few people, because I'm a horrible spiritual person, uh, uh, father, I I I have no patience, I have no, I I, I tell you something two times, then you just don't waste my time, go away, find someone else. Uh, That's that's the truth, so I really have, I don't know, 10 people who are just stubborn enough and don't don't go away. Uh, I feel much more comfortable 
to tell them, look, follow what you, what, what, what's honest within you than a law. Because the law is not your own. If, if, if there's love within you, and, or if there's a calling within you, even if that calling is against the law, know two things. That be honest before Christ and say, this is what I feel. I cannot say I don't feel this, because I feel it. It would be a lie. Everything I build, I would be building on a lie. I feel this, so I'll follow it. That's number one. And number two, I know that your word is truth, not my own. So when you feel you've got an entry into my heart, please come in and change it. Be honest at every single moment of your life. And always fight to leave the door open for Christ to come in. Don't become one of those institutionalized Christians. Honestly, I mean, to tell you the truth now, that's one of the reasons I didn't want to come before. Because I remember when I was starting to become a rich economist, um, there was this thing in Romania called the Oso Association of Orthodox Christian Students. And I thought, well, I'm a student, I'm a Christian Orthodox, I want to join this thing. And I went there, and all I saw were young men in their, you know, very early 20s or nine, you know, late teens, with beards, smelling horribly, and having this <laughs> pious-looking figure that all I wanted was to punch them constantly. <laughs> and these, these young ladies that were just like dressed in black wool. You're 19, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, uh, I, I know I shouldn't say these things. That's why I try to stay away from these meetings. <laughs> if you don't live your life then, you'll get to be 30 or 40. You will have the wife and the 10 children. And then you'll start thinking, because the devil will give you the thought, I haven't actually lived my life. I haven't actually lived my life. I've obeyed other people's laws. I've followed other people's rules. Are these my laws? Are these my values? Is this who I am? As you move into middle age, and as death becomes more and more difficult to cover up with noise, these questions will just eat you like cancer. And if you don't have experience behind it, you will not resist, and you will fall. And there's one thing to fall when you are 18, 19, 21, 22. It can be cute. But when you are 40, and your falling means you've ruined a woman's life, and the life of 10 other children, and you may be already a priest or a deacon or on the way to do that, and there are so many hundreds of people looking up to you and following your example, if you fail then, that's going to be a long way to fall. So just trust that there is an age and a time for everything, sin included. But whatever you do, grab Christ with you. When you go into a nightclub, be aware that he is with you. In all honesty, be aware he is here with me. When you do whatever you do, he is there with you, just as real as when you receive communion. It's only that we can't perceive him in a physical way, the way we do when we eat him. It's not like God is kept away by walls, or like, you know, he doesn't like certain types of music, and therefore you will not go into... It, that, that, it, don't construct that type of thinking. Be aware what you do, and then do it. I think out of all the books in the Old Testament, the, I never know how to pronounce this, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Read that, yeah. because there's so much wisdom in that, and it's so, uh, you know, delivered in such a normal type of way. It's not posh wisdom, it's real wisdom, uh, practical wisdom. Um, there's something about talents and somebody asked a question about talents last night and uh, talents change 
with time and with age. And that's something else I, I try to force myself to, to remember that I actually change as well and who I am today was not within me yesterday really and will be dead by tomorrow because I will be someone else. So the difference in years are even <coughs> greater. Um, our talents change. It may be, think of saints, think of, I mean we live in the United Kingdom and our local saint, although not yet canonized, but he is a saint, his father Sufroni, Sahara. Think of him, I mean, this man was a painter. This man was a painter. And he went all the way with his painting, looking for a spiritual way out of life. <laughs> you know, uh, a, a spiritual way to survive death through painting. And then eventually, although he gave everything to painting, it failed, it collapsed, and then his talents changed from being a painter into being a monastic, and then being a founder of a monastery, and then being a spiritual father. As we grow old, we have to allow ourselves the flexibility to say goodbye to old versions of ourselves. The fact that you may be a good writer, singer, painter, architect, lawyer, whatever now, doesn't mean that in five or 15 or 50 years from now, you should be the same. As we grow more aware of who we are and our relationship with God becomes more real and not so much theoretical, uh, our, our talents change as well. You know, go from painter to being a monastic and so on. It's funny, in some, it's, it's dangerous, it's not funny, because in many ways, if you hold on to your talents and you don't let go to embrace the new ones, when Christ is signaling it's time to die and be born again as something else, those talents that made you move forward could end up killing you. Um, there's that bit in, in, in the gospel about the wedding when the emperor calls the friends of his son to his son's wedding. Or maybe he's not an emperor, I don't know. I'm, I'm a horrible yeah, a king. A tsar. Uh, <coughs> and they all say no. What is striking to me about that answer is not that they say no. That's understandable in some way. You just don't want to go, so you say no. But all their reasons, all those excuses, are good reasons. They don't say, I can't make it because I want to go out and you know, meet a prostitute tonight. Or I can't come because tonight I want to go and party. Or, uh, you know, they all say, I can't come because I got married. I've got a wife. I can't come because I've got a new piece of land and I want to have a look at it and work it. I can't come because I bought new oxen and I have to make use of them and work my land and support my family. They're all very good, positive things. They are, in fact, God's commandment. You shall work the land to feed yourself and, and you know, uh, keep on living. And yet these positive things, these talents that were positive, constructive, and so on for a while become a reason for damnation later in life. <coughs> so be very aware that our identities are, in fact, extremely flexible and fluid, and, and we know very little about ourselves. The fact that you are a painter today means nothing about tomorrow. Be 100% a painter today and remain 100% open to be something entirely different tomorrow. That's the way to move forward. That's the way to remain open to Christ's calling. You know, think of the apostles as well. How many other people must have seen Christ, and they remain closed in into their own lives. You know, I'm a fisherman, I've got a family, I've got a home, I've got to take care of them. He says, come to his apostles, and that's all it takes, they're already open, to drop everything and follow him. That openness, if you try it in your heart, if you try it in a practical way, is extremely difficult, because we all, build false identities of who we are. We all build false, well, 
they're all false. We all build idols of who we are. And then we spend, or rather waste, our lives worshipping and tending to the idols we have constructed. Be ready to say, this is the end of my life. This is the end of the world as we know it at any point in your life. And always start anew or something else if you have that calling within you. Um, I'm, I'm trying desperately to find a good idea to finish. Um, <laughs> that I've been to, um, there was a good exhibition in London um, <coughs> at the British Museum of, on the Celts. At the end of last year, I think it was until January, February this year. <coughs> and when I went to see this exhibition, I discovered that the very word Celt <coughs> actually comes from Greek. And this is not a joke. It really comes from Greek. There's a word, <laughs> keltoi, um, which basically means those on the outside. That's, that's how the Greeks, or whatever they were back then, refer to these war-loving tribes, those on the outside, the outside of the empire. Those are the Celts, those on the outside. And in many ways, I believe this is our vocation here, to, to fight not to integrate, but to remain on the outside and to remind the world that we are called to be outside of this earthly being, earthly existence. This is our calling, not to become the world, but to remind the world that we are all outsiders. We are all Celts in this way. Um, I'll just stop there, and maybe if there are questions, we'll all see where that leads us. Yeah. We've got some more time. Okay, okay.